Uganda is a place of wondrous natural beauty, bustling cities, and idyllic villages. The African Great Lakes, including Lake Victoria, pepper its borders. It's also home to a tiny, cramped neonatal intensive care unit that serves a region with a population of about 4 million. That NICU produces a sea of statistics about infant mortality and birth rates. But for the mothers and babies who end up there, the only critical number is how much weight the baby has gained or lost each day. At the center of these swirling statistics, we met a family with two young children, a couple of medical degrees, and an exceptional lifestyle. The family was called to Mbali, Uganda from the UK, though not in the traditional missionary sense, you know, called by God. They don't identify as religious. They felt the simple call of human need. Kathy's a neonatologist, and Adam's an anesthesiologist, and they have two beautiful young daughters. They hail from the UK, and despite having worked and traveled all over the world, they've decided Mbali, Uganda is the place that they like to raise their little family. We're headed from the capital, Kampala, to Mbali Regional Referral Hospital, where Kathy and Adam operate out of. They run a charity devoted to newborn health care called Born on the Edge. We're looking forward to introducing you to Kathy, Adam, and the work they do, but it's about a four to five hour journey and there's a lot to see along the way. I think one of the cool things about this trip right here is leaving Kampala, going through Jinja, crossing the Nile, and heading over to Mbali is that you get to see the towns, you get to see in this area kind of the swamplands, really things I think that people don't think of when they think of Uganda. Anytime Craig says stop the van, that's when the trouble begins. We can eat this if we can just get it out of the hole. <laughs> Where did Earl die? <laughs> it was a Muslim congregation that was getting together. We were welcomed in with peace and love and brotherhood, and we were almost converted. After the traditional Ugandan circumcision ritual, ill-advised lizard hunt, and the Muslim revival, we were only about halfway to Mbali and on the shores of Lake Victoria. As Africa's largest lake and second largest in the world by some measures, a small detour seemed in order. Followed by a sampling of the local fare, silverfish. <laughs> we arrived in Mbali late in the day and prepared for an early start. Kathy and Adam's day starts like any family with young children, but it quickly diverges as Kathy leaves the secure compound they call home and heads to Mbali Regional Hospital. Adam won't be too far behind her. They founded Born on the Edge to improve newborn healthcare worldwide. Mbali Regional Hospital is their first and largest project. Their goals are to educate local healthcare providers, develop and implement modern healthcare systems, and create sustainable practices, in theory. In reality, they do all that and a thousand other things. Kathy explains that the Mbali Regional Hospital is funded by the Ugandan Ministry of Health and serves a population of four million people in the region. Due to space limitations and crowding, visitors and even some patients spend most of their time outside. So in the neonatal unit, because it's so small and we had space for 10 mothers to sleep, now we haven't got anywhere for anyone to sleep. So they have to sleep outside, which is fine if it's a nice day like today. They can sit out here, they, can, they will put their stoves down here and they cook. But if it rains, all of these people will try and squeeze into that tiny space in there. So if it's 
power's out, it's raining, and it's nighttime. Right. It must just be horrific. I mean, this is a super busy hospital. We have about 10,000 deliveries a year. So if I can give you a comparison to a hospital back home in the UK, a busy hospital in the UK would deliver about six or 7,000 a year. When I first moved here, why would you have that many children? You, know, you have so little food to feed those babies. Then when you actually begin to talk to friends and patients, you realize that yes, they had eight or nine, but they lost two when they were a baby. They lost another one from meningitis. They lost another one from a road traffic accident, another one from malaria. And actually, they've only got three that are alive. So to get from zero to five here, it's just such an achievement. Hats off to anyone here who makes it to five years old because it's not easy to get there. Kathy takes me and a Western medical professional, Manoj, to where she spends most of her time, the neonatal intensive care unit. Wow. Good morning. First time I walked into the NICU, I was just shocked. It's hot, it's open air, it's chaotic, it's loud. It's cramped. You can't walk very far without touching somebody. <laughs> and you're largely touching someone the whole time. Yeah. My daughter started out in NICU in the US. But it was very far from this. I think I've probably forgotten a little bit what it's like. <laughs> right. The single biggest barrier to successful outcomes is what? Space. 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 Yeah. The babies are so close, they spread all their in infections. We spread infections to each other. You feel like you want to wash your hands and you're stuck in that tiny corner there. This particular NICU is uh, intended for how many babies? <laughs> Ten. So we have more so than that. When we, <laughs> we do, when we designed it, we had these beds here, so that was for the mother to sleep on. And I have got right. photos when we first opened with the mother sleeping here, right. either doing kangaroo if it was a small baby, or if not, then the baby could go in the couch at the end. And now we can have up to seven babies on, on every bed. Do you have to turn away? We never turn away, we just squeeze. There's, <laughs> there's nowhere to refer them to, so... This is, this is it. This is it. It is perfect. Oh, it's so lovely. You're working almost six days out of the week, mm. pretty much. Yeah. And always I mean, on the phone if they need. So much. How do you do it? If you enjoy something and you're passionate about it, you, you don't mind. It's not a job, you know. No one pays me to come to work. I, I right. came back to work when my baby was three weeks old. You yeah. know, if I don't come to work, no one's going to re replace you. So to see those mothers come back with a baby that's alive. It's you know, the aspect of seeing change the mother's your, yeah. face yeah. before or after. Right. Hey, Manoj, there's room for you here. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it. I might do it for a month or two, but somebody that's been here for so long, that's true passion. Wow. Kathy had some work to do, so we caught up with Adam in between his lectures at the medical school and a few surgeries he was overseeing the anesthesia for. I just came out of the neonatal clinic a second ago and sweating, it's hot, and it's open air like this, and shocking at some level. And in the meantime, while Kathy's over there, you're here, I think you were just lecturing, I believe. What's yes, that? doing some uh, doing some teaching with the medical students. Um, but I thought you did anesthesia. Well, I do <laughs> anesthesia, but but what I was teaching today was just teaching basic pr basic principles of how to assess a sick patient for right. the medical students. So teaching them some good basic skills. Yeah. So Kathy helps to run the neonatal unit and spends right. most of her time there. I find myself somehow getting involved in everything from fixing broken equipment right. to helping they're building a surgical complex right. so I go to the meetings and All give right. them some technical <laughs> advice right yeah um, designing curriculums in the university right. Um, trying to make sure we have drugs in stock, donations overseas, mm -hmm. all of, uh, pretty much anything. Adam had to head into surgery, and as he did, we found out the water had just stopped working. These conditions are extreme, but through their partnership with the hospital, they've made real progress. The difficult but encouraging numbers around the NICU say it all. They hadn't collected the data before, and they found, we had found that first month, 120 admissions, and we had a 52% mortality, so it's that 60-something babies died. And most of them die within the first 24 hours that they've been admitted, so we didn't need much space, because if they come in and they die, it's kind of easy. So when we designed our new neonatal ward, based on extrapolating those numbers, we thought we'd need space for about 10 babies. Last month we hit 209 admissions, so we've almost doubled our admission rate. Right. Um, and our mortality's now dropped to about 15, 16%. So we have about 
between 20 and 30 deaths a month, which is still horrible to look at. Right. You know, when you have your big file each month of who's died, it does make you feel sad. But compared to if we'd had a 52% mortality of 209 babies, that's 105 babies dying. I definitely could have, have coped with that. I'd have left long ago. The increase in admittance and the decrease in mortality is amazing. But success has consequences. As more babies survive and people arrive from farther and farther away because of the hospital's reputation, it exacerbates the space issue. And not only that, it can be very hard on those who come into Mbali from all over the region. Now, my mother struggled to live here. It's like me going to London and trying to live off takeaways and in a hotel for however long you're in hospital, and it's so expensive. Here, they can't live off their own land. They're buying all the time, so it's really not sustainable. These are families. I mean, it's just not one woman who happened to come in on the ambulance. Um, you're, you're really displacing a whole family with the siblings and the other family members. Well, for that, I mean, it's really hard. They come here, and you're right, they'll come and they'll have one attendant with them, and it's normally an auntie or a friend. The father, we don't often see them, but we do occasionally. The mother comes here with the attendant. The attendant then has had enough. She's got her own family to look after. So you've got a mother left here on her own who's post-delivery, she's got pain, it's hard for her to move, she will need someone to look after her, but she's often here on her own. So there's a lot of bargaining with them, you know, and explanations that they have to stay here to complete their treatment. This is Sauda. Sauda and her husband, Denis, live here in Mbali, and so in some ways have it much easier than others. But their daughter still requires 24-hour care and at least one of the parents to be there the entire time. Often that means they're outside to get the baby sun or practicing, quote, kangaroo care by swaddling the baby against their chest for warmth and skin-to-skin -skin contact. When you brought your baby here, did you think that you would be able to leave with your baby healthy? I feared a lot. I've, I've, never, I've never seen such. Hmm. I was told she even carried the cloth where they're going to put the dead body. So when you came, you didn't bring clothing for your baby to leave with a nice dress because you felt like you were having to... The dead body. That you would leave with your dead body. I was surprised. I've never but seen that before. Dr. Kathy is a special woman. Yes, very special. She loves babies. Hmm. She has that love, much love for babies. Right. We saw you and you're like the third baby on a, on a bed with five. You've got two babies on either side of you. And you spend most of your days there beside your baby, is that correct? Yeah. You have to sit around, supervise the oxygen. Right. When it goes off, you have to put back. Mm. So if you are two people, it will help you. One comes out to rest, the right. other one is inside. When ah. she gets tired, she comes outside, who I comes? Back. So you re, you replace her. Yeah, you're that, her. That, that's what we do. And you have a job as well. I mean, you're a teacher. I'm a teacher, professionally. And now you have this responsibility. And I'm a professional. A kangaroo. And you're a kangaroo. Yes, I'm a kangaroo. Yeah. <laughs> I feel good, really, when I put her here. I really feel good. Right. In fact, one of the challenges I'm seeing. By the time I've stayed here, I've spent everything I've saved on, right. on feeding. So you spend most of the evenings in here? Yeah. Do you have a place to go home and stay, or do you mostly stay here at the clinic? Yeah, we, mostly, at the we mostly stay here. I go home, maybe when there is something I'm going to pick. Go pick up breakfast, come back. Right. Lunch time, I go pick lunch, supper, and maybe I get for something to eat at night. At night, she eats. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is a mother. Yeah. <laughs> Denny was headed home to prepare lunch for he and Sauda. We tagged along to see what it was like for a family living in Mbali. All right, we're on our way to go see Dennis's house. Can't see anything going wrong here. Never seen a Muzungu, so She's never seen the Mzungu. She's never seen the Mzungu. Who is this one? <laughs> Hello. Do you see where the baby will be staying? So this is this is one. You have three, and then two, three on the other side. Six in this one little block. Six yeah. more behind it. Catch yeah. it. Home. This is where we are going to bring uh, our baby, mm -hmm. me and my wife. What do you worry about as a father? Uh, my biggest worry when I bring in my baby, I mean, most cases is feeding them, and, and you know they are delicate. Right. So that is my worry. Every morning when I wake up, I, I pick up my stove, move outside, prepare some water. Where does the water come from? We, we have a tap you, out, out, outside. You just but bring it, it in it here. is on and off. Oh, so really? whenever it comes, you make sure you get enough. Uh, prepare some simple, simple food uh, for my wife. At times I prepare, at times I have to buy. In a day you are using something like 20,000. It's really Against 300,000 a yeah. month, that's a ton of, yeah, that's, yeah. I don't know how you so do it. Had, yeah, and one. you're an artist. Yeah. I mean, that's the uh, first yeah. thing I notice as soon yeah. as we come uh, in. 
Ah, uh, this is a circumcision, circumcision sequence. Yeah, sequence. Remember this? Same thing. To be honest, it makes me nervous just looking at these. Why doesn't he look happy? <laughs> so, <laughs> when they're cutting you, even if you feel oh pain and then fall down, they pick you, get hold of you, uh -huh. get the legs and then... They drink. keep going? Yeah, forcefully, until they finish it. Wow. Yeah, there's no, no half circumcision. Yeah, they have to complete it. And then the other one, this the is the one, Marwa. Yeah, there is that one of millet and then there is that one of maize. Mm. That one of maize is weak. Mm. And then that one of uh, millet, it's made by itasoids and it can make you drunk very fast. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we might just get a chance to do that. Yeah. After eating lunch with Sauda, Denis headed back to work where he teaches art at a local high school. All right, so we're here with Dennis. He's an art teacher, and uh, so he's going to introduce so, us to his class. Now's our cue. Malembe. <laughs> Earl, and... Craig. <laughs> When he finished work and after he dropped off dinner for Sauda, he offered to show us where they make Malrua, the fermented local beverage he had immortalized on campus. How could we say no? And it's strong, I can already tell. Yeah, that and one, the, if you take that one. This <laughs> one is the beginning of the end. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. What do you think, brother? I will tell you, it's better than Coors. <laughs> I'm not sure we're fans of the stuff, but the experience made a biker bar seem boring. So when you see the mountain, does this make you feel like you're at home? Yeah, you feel good. Yeah, and you, where you came from, is it's right up here? Yeah. Is it in that direction? Yeah. It's a night out for this new father, so we took him to dinner, where he enjoyed the reprieve from this stressful time in his life. Cheers. <laughs> Hopefully health and family. Mm. It's Sunday morning, and Denis is no doubt headed back to the hospital. But for Kathy and Adam, this is their only day off. They graciously invite us to their home so we could get a better sense of their lives here. Well, we didn't know how long we were coming for, like maybe one year or however long. So we lived here with next to no furniture or anything for about a year. We had one sofa, one bed. And then when we decided we were staying, we branched out a little bit and got a bit more furniture. So it's a bit more like home now. When we came back last year, we brought back photos and things and, and put them up. So yeah, very much feels like home. What was the decision to come here? I mean, again, well, out of all the places. We've always wanted to work overseas. The problem would have been we never worked overseas together. We got married in 2007 and then uh, we spent some time to get living together, but because I was in the military and then Kathy worked in Thailand. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've been living apart for a long time. Right. So the most important thing was to find somewhere we could live together. And, a, and, and apart, right? Just to be clear, you guys rarely see each other. Well, we do see each other. <laughs> at least we see each other in the evenings. There you and go. Every Sunday. <laughs> no, we, we do pretty well. So we were looking, people recommended lots of places in Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, and Bali just happened to be the first place we visited and we liked it so much, we, uh, we came back. Stuck. Uh, but what were the things that you're weighing though when you're deciding, okay, yes, we want to work overseas. And we also want to have children. It has to be safe mm -hmm. for the children. That's mm -hmm. the main thing. And when we visited here, we saw two or three families with lots of children, expats or uh, mm -hmm. Mazungus. Um, and they said it was safe living here. Mm. So that's the most important thing. Uh, what's different about raising kids, do you think, here versus, you know, all of your friends from school? It's so much more relaxed, I think. I mean, they spend all their time outside. Even when we want to be in, they want to be out. And you know, even young children of my friends back home, they, they spend a lot of time, I think, inside on computers, on iPads and things like but that. You don't have computers and we iPads have an I for the We kids. do have computers, us two, and then Sal has an iPad, or yes. she calls it an iPadum, which I think comes from Adam, <laughs> but anyway, it's stuff. Right, so we, is... we personally own an iPadum. <laughs> it's your friend, is it? Hello. <laughs> Hi, patients. How are you? You're very smart today. All right. <laughs> are you just from church? Yes. No. How is mummy? How is baby? Uh, mm. I guess it's possible they miss out on stuff, you know, like yeah. I see my friends going to family farm trips and right. that kind of thing, or adventure playgrounds, or you know, perhaps simple things like going to feed the ducks. But that, that said, we can go for a walk in the morning and we see a cow delivering a calf on the side of the road, so. Mm -hmm. Do they have cousins? They have lots of cousins, yes. Yeah, so. so do you miss that? Yeah, I really miss them. And seeing them grow up 
and they won't have any idea really who mm -hmm. I am. The beauty is of Skype now that you can, can speak to them and see them so they recognize us and the ones right. that are a bit older mm -hmm. remember us but and vice versa mm. you know they want to see these ones and see how they're growing up. We came uh, probably to stay for maybe a year but the longer we stay here the longer we will stay here so using work as an example in the NHS I mean there are lots of gaps but they don't miss us right and, uh, whereas here if we left there would be a big gap and as the longer you stay the more you get involved in mm -hmm. the more responsibilities you have and the more you take on and so it's harder then to leave really everything that we do we try and make it sustainable but there's a period to develop sustainability of course uh, but we've been here now two and a half years with Kathy in the neonatal unit when she first came they would never have been able to do what they can do now mm -hmm. but we went back to the UK last year to have Luena mm -hmm. for seven weeks um, and things very, almost nothing changed if you're always thinking about making sure the things you do are sustainable then if you had to leave let's say if something happened to one of our families or something right. happened to one of us then hopefully maybe 60 or 70 percent of what we do would remain this is the period of time and this is really your opportunity to make you know your money you know it's these next 10 or 15 years so how much does that factor into what are you making money for if i think about what i need money for one is our children to go to school um, and the other thing is when you retire you have to be able to live mm -hmm. happily we don't need much it depends what you want mm -hmm. isn't it? so it's not about the money the hospital doesn't even pay them they only survive on donations. And it's not about faith or religion. Why do they do it? Well, we got some idea on the last day at the hospital. Meet Harriet and baby Dora. Your hair's very beautiful today. <laughs> Maybe you even knew you were gonna go into television. Yeah. It looks very lovely. Do you recall how much she weighed and how much does she weigh now? She was weighing 1.1 and now she's 3.1. <laughs> she's huge. She's She's no use. <laughs> <laughs> she makes me happy now. <laughs> I was so, so afraid, uh, afraid of it. I lost hope completely. I even told her that maybe you just let me go back home because I'm wasting maybe just time. But she did a lot. She just returned my hope in me and she gave me happiness again. Indeed, I'm now happy. And then I remembered that I'm not the only one. We are many going through this situation. So once, when I also went the inside there, I also tell them, at least we have a smile. Yes. Look, smiling. <laughs> yeah. Two yeah. smiles. Yeah. <laughs> Two <laughs> smiles. That's right. happy. <laughs> Thank you, Harriet. Right. Really lovely to see you. Mm. Thank you, doctor. Keep in touch. Ta okay. Tell us how she's doing when she's sitting, when she's walking. She's nice. not laughing. She can laugh. She can laugh. Can you laugh at me? I'm not very funny. <laughs> Namboso and her baby Miracle are more than just another success story. Namboso has also been trained to support and encourage other mothers in the clinic. It's, it's a miracle sometimes to see what Kathy and her team are able to do for women that come in with babies who are very, very sick. Yeah, but I appreciate <laughs> Dr. Kathy for the good work she has done because I couldn't expect this baby. But God is great. The baby survived. I try to advise those mothers. Right. My dear, do this and this. If you take the advice of the doctor, you are going to get what you want. You're a great success story. And as you say, now you're able to help other women as well. That's brilliant. So I thank Kathy for the good work she has done. <laughs> I've heard that. That's not the first time I've heard that she's done good work. <laughs> she has done a good work. The list of people they've touched and the lives they've saved goes on and on. Kathy and Adam may not be from Mbali or even Uganda, but they're fighting to make a difference in the community they love. Countless people have benefited from the work they do, but to hear them tell it, they feel like they've benefited most of all. No, they're not from there. And yes, Mbali is a long way from the UK and the grandparents and the financial success and professional rewards of the National Health Service. But they belong there. And by their own words, they may never leave.